Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is COSI interim meeting. It's an official ITF meeting, and as such, the note will apply. Uh, I believe everyone in the call is already familiar with it, but in case anyone has any questions, uh, please ask me or Matthew. So this is the agenda for today. We'll start with a few updates for uh, draft status and the charter. And uh, our plan is to spend the biggest chunk of time discussing X509. Hopefully, uh, all the issues that we have could be resolved today, but in any case, uh, we would like at least to have very uh, better clarity what needs to be done there. Is there any bashing of this agenda? Hi, Vilo. You're on here. Yes. Sorry. I'm also from regarding the IANA registrations. Right. I provided some slides just now. Sorry, it's been very late. Um, um, yeah. first time, uh, and people think that is it worth discussing, and we can I can talk over those slides. Okay. Okay, I see two two sets of slides that have been provided. Uh, yeah, that I guess that should be fine, provided that we manage to finish with. Uh, the X509 discussion a little bit earlier. How much time would you need for for the IANA discussion and yeah, the slides? I think 10 minutes is fine. It depends on what you want. We could just have it as an information point in which it goes even quicker, but 10 minutes okay. will allow some comments. Okay. Yeah, that, that sounds fine to me. Okay, so uh, the minutes are taken at this link. Uh, I also pasted it in the chat. Please, uh, if you have the chance, help us uh, uh, write the minutes. And also in Jabber, we'll be taking a look, but uh, in case anyone is using uh, the Jabber room. Uh, yes, please help us also uh, see any important discussions that are happening there. And yes, the meeting and the attendance are recorded. Uh, so the, in the minutes there is uh, attendees list. Please write your name there if you are not already in the list. So that's all for this slide, I believe. So for the document status, uh, the changes are uh, mostly related to the BIS documents. The BIS truck document is now in the RFC editor queue and uh, uh, I believe everything is also noted uh, in the communication with Ayana. I think everything is clear there. Uh, so the next step for the COSI counter sign is uh, for us to uh, decide who would be the shepherd and uh, proceed with the shepherd uh, write-up. Uh, regarding this with uh, Matthew, we were considering asking the participants for help uh, with the Shepherd Rider, if anyone um, volunteers, that would be uh, really appreciated. Uh, 
Um, yes, you can also reach to us uh, via email. It's not uh, necessary to do that now. Generally, it's not a huge amount of work, but yes, you will be uh, you will need to still follow up on the draft uh, progress. So the next point is the rechartering. I think we will need uh, to discuss with Ben how uh, what are the next steps from our point of view. I, um, I think we have some text that uh, is in a good state, but yes, what would be the next steps, Ben? Uh, yes, so the last time that I looked at it, there was one pull request open in GitHub that looked like it was correct. So I believe we should merge that pull request and then I can put it into the data tracker and get the official rechartering process started. Okay, yeah, I will merge the pull request. And... Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. So the next point is uh, about the X509. I saw that there are also some slides provided by uh, John. So I haven't had the chance to look at them yet. Uh, use um, them if you want. Uh, there was some request for slides. I'm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will. Uh, share them just now. And, da, da, da. Okay, I guess you should be seeing the new slides. So, okay. Yes, there is uh, the discussion around the uh, trust relation that is uh, connected to the X5U uh, uh, attributes header parameter. And uh, in discussions with people, uh, what I think uh, been summarized well in one email was that uh, not having the um, X5U header in the protected fields uh, could potentially lead to some larger um, attack surface. And that is the main reason, I guess, Jim thought of it this way and uh, it sounded reasonable to me. What was mentioned is that uh, in the other cases, we always have the certificate. Uh, so there is no chance to, sw to slap a certificate keeping the same key. And uh, when we use uh, this header parameter, in theory, an attacker might be able to do something like that. I don't know if Ben could explain it better, but yeah, that's my understanding of uh, the reason to uh, to mandate uh, this parameter being in the protected header. So since you mentioned me, I guess I will jump in. I don't think that I can actually convincingly explain this. I think I, what you described and, and what I said earlier is sort of a potential explanation. But I think right now we are kind of trying to reverse engineer why Jim wrote this text. And I almost wonder if it would be um, safer or better to just try to do a 
clean analysis of the situation from the start in terms of what the pieces of information are and how they are flowing um, and what needs to be protected under which circumstances and what does not um, because that would sort of catch if there are any other cases that that would need to be similarly protected uh, and that is probably not something we could do live during the meeting it would need to be a, a little bit more focused activity um, but that might be a, a good path forward i think you know, if we were to go back to the sort of try to reverse engineer this text, um, there is some qualitative difference between what's going on in terms of, um, you know, you have this third party and I mean, I think what this text says that the person generating the cozy message does need to have a trust relationship with the party that's hosting the referred to resource. Uh, in terms of they will provide the correct certificate when requested. But the chain of reasoning between I need to have a trust relationship with this other party to why that specifically needs to be in the protected header bucket, um, protected attribute bucket, that chain of reasoning is not very clear to me. Uh, because so, so like Ben, this is Russ. I think the... Um idea is there's two ways that you could get back a certificate that is not the one the sender intended. One is the URL in the message could be changed by putting it in the protected bucket, you, you prevent that. And the second is whatever server you're contacting with that URL could send you the wrong thing. And that's why the trust relationship, because we don't have a protection against that. The only way to to prevent that would be to put a hash in the uh, parameter of the thing you're expected to get back. Right, and so I guess for the threat model here, and sorry to back up. Thank you for for stating it like that. I think that was uh, a point that I was going to try to make, but not as well. Um, so if we consider the threat model of, I think it was the first one you mentioned, where somebody in theory could change the actual value of the URL in transit. Um, if we, if the threat model requires an attacker that can do that, what else could that attacker do if we were using like the X5 bag or, or whatnot and not the X5U? I think that's really the key thing, and I don't understand this this connection. This is Michael. I don't understand this statement at all. I think that it is equivalent to downloading the certificate, putting it in X5 bag, and then what is a what occurs. And the other complexity about this is what about the 6125 stuff? If this is an HTTP link that we're supposed to retrieve the certificate from, how do we know whether we've done that right? Um, uh, so I would prefer not to put it in the in the protected attribute. I don't think it, there's any value. Yeah, I think I think we need to discuss if if we want to put some protect something and then what there is it might be reason to protect identities, for example. Uh, but then it would be I agree with Rust that pushing a hash in the protected would protect. Uh, would provide protection, but that would be bad for the use cases we have in ad hoc, which already put the end certificate in the external AAD. So then, then it would be good if this additional hash is optional if you provide protection otherwise. Uh, but I also agree with Ben that this is probably something we need to go back and have a whiteboard discussion about. Um, Seems to be different agreement opinions. Uh, Kirsten, I think you should go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, to, to make the life easier for the, the note taker, I, I wrote up what I'm going to say. Um, so the 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 other certificate containers we have there are there to divulge information to the recipient. So it, it's strictly adding information that the recipient may not have 
at this point in time. So nothing, nothing is identified as, as being in any way uh, special or trusted or, or anything. And um, so th th there is no consequence uh, if the wrong information is being divulged, except that, well, the, the, the chains won't validate. So the, the whole thing is not going to, to have the, the intended uh, effect. Um, so um, if this certificate is, is intended to be validated under the same authorization policies um, as, as the other ones, uh, I, I don't understand what the special uh, uh, relationship is here. And um, <clears throat> the other question I have is, uh, what exactly, what do we mean by protecting it? Are we talking about integrity or are we talking about for confidentiality? So um, I'm, I'm not sure we, we have even talked about confidentiality in this uh, context, but of course there may be some confidentiality objectives here as well. I'm pretty sure this was integrity, but <laughs> you're, you're, you're right that uh, it's a different kind of attribute that's both. Yeah, so so I, I can rephrase my question is what what objective is that integrity protection actually achieving? So and this is Hank and if I might add and what are we losing when it's in the unprotected header uh, and therefore uh, if someone strips it out, uh, do we lose anything here that's intended to be uh, there? Uh, and it's reliably there. So that sometimes the integrity uh, domain of the signature is used to make sure that some stuff reaches the intended uh, um, destination. So that's not the use of it, of course, but it can be used as such. So uh, maybe just thinking at least a cycle about what do we lose if we are, if it's stripped from the uh, message, uh, is that bad? I think one, I think both Russ and Hillary mentioned that you need protection. I don't know what they intended. They can, but one reason why you might want to integrate protect that is, for example, mentioned in the Sigma protocol is that is the attack where somebody borrows your public key and register it with a different identity. Um, CS has obviously in the past not been uh, always been doing proof of possession of the private key and then someone can just strip this put in their own identity and the cozy signature would still verify yeah maybe that's just a security consideration uh part of this and not the extra body or maybe again both by to make an issue of Okay, so as a way forward, it sounds like we would need to uh, try to reevaluate what is the types of attacks that we want to, uh, yeah, what is the security, uh, what are the security assumptions, and uh, try to understand better whether indeed we need this or not. Um, I am not sure I would be uh, able to help too much with that. Yeah, so I think since John was proposing maybe that it would be optional to put it in the protected bucket, uh, could we ask John to try to take a look and perhaps propose text that would do that? 
not to put you on the spot, John. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can try to provide something and try to, I guess it was, maybe we need more discussion on this also at the ITF meeting, but I can try to put in some work. I'm depending on this draft as a normative reference in ad hoc, but also as a informal reference for the uh, CBOR certificate uh, work, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and just uh, one point I would like us to mention. I don't know if it's um, being discussed before. Uh, there was an email from uh, another SDO that was looking into using this draft. So obviously they are kind of help, uh, hoping to have it finished soon. Uh, of course, this does not mean we should rush this thing, just uh, something to keep in mind. Yeah, this is adding to that. Uh, yeah, there are uh, a few, I think, efforts uh, that, that realize, oh, this is really useful and uh, are starting uh, to uh, include in, in, in their own IDs, but I don't think there is a, uh, a cluster problem yet. I don't know. Uh, so, but yes, I think I would support the notion that there is, uh, uh, has been making, made, made use of this work and we should uh, see that it's, uh, it's progressing. I, I'm, I'm not rushing, not pressuring, but we should not end uh, on the other side. That's it. So Ben, do, do we know what ISO 1803-5 uses X5 view for, if any? I do not think that I know exactly which X509 attributes it uses. So that, that might be an agenda item, an action item to, to find that out. Um, so we better understand what, what how people are currently interpreting this. Right. I am trying to pull up my email archive in the background and can get back to you if I have some actual details. Yeah, so ha having the actual FDIS uh, would, would be useful. I don't know if that, that's actually available anywhere. So oh, it's at this stage, not after this. Okay, but, but that, that's still a state that is pretty much cooked. So, um, I, so think, but, I think they said they're just using X5 chain. Good. Yeah, so um, the, the, the question I, I have uh, in, in mind really is, um, does providing this certificate lend it any, any special position, any special meaning, any special authorization in, in effect uh, from the point of view of the uh, COSI sender that, that uh, needs to be recognized by the recipient? Because I think that's really the, the place where we generate security problems, where, where sender and receiver don't agree on the semantics to, of putting some, some data, some signature, or something else in a specific position. And we have to be very, very clear about what that actually means that something is in X5U. My assumption is that it was just a way to retrieve a certificate that was used in chain building for the, the signature of the COSI message, and there were no additional semantics. Uh, in particular, you should not add the received certificate to your trust store. So essentially, the, the trust relationship that, that uh, uh, Jim is talking about is one that is needed for availability, but not for the other security objectives. Hmm. I don't think it's just availability. I think you it's trusted to provide the same bits to everybody. Yeah, but what, what does it mean? <laughs> I mean, th these bits already exist in some form. So 
putting these bits in, in the, indirectly in the X5U five five position, how is that different from putting them into the chain position where we also have a protected and an unprotected uh, situation? Wow. The only reason I can come up with is that there's a, a third party that is uh, potentially off the path that the cozy message itself is traversing. And so someone who is not on the path of the cozy message has an opportunity to affect the interpretation of the message. But that doesn't really seem like it's strong enough to always mandate it go in the protected header. I don't know. Um, is there a possible issue if the URL is modified to target a specific other machine, like trying to open too many um, SSL connections or whatever? I think there is some potential risk there. I don't see it as a, as a very useful attack vector, but I think that is a good point to consider that when you receive a message that uses X5U, it is expected that you are going to then initiate an outbound connection to that address. So that's something we need to remember and document if we don't already. Hi, this is Jonathan Hamill. So that that's a good point in that that could trigger like if if the sender or if the receiver of the message, I guess, is expecting some sort of privacy of uh, if there's additional confidentiality protections that that uh, that on the message that they received that this outbound connection trigger might inform someone that that a certain recipient has received that message. Okay, so I guess we can for now uh, wait for John to try to uh, dig a little bit more into this and uh, discuss it again during the ITF meeting. Yeah, I can I can try to provide some initial suggestion or explanation of the problem and uh, yeah uh, no later than the next in the idf meeting maybe i'll tr send something to the mailing list before that yeah. that sounds wonderful thank you i expect that if anyone else wanted to contribute to that work it would be welcome oh, oh yes <laughs> Uh, sorry, this is like a uh, contribution does not mean adding new weird ideas, but uh, uh, working on the current issues and, and editorial stuff, right? I think it means doing a, a systematic analysis of ah, yeah. what, what data flows with the various parameters. Yeah. Make sure we understand the, the risks that might be protect, that might be prevented by using the protected header bucket. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so John, did we discuss 
Ah, okay, I see one more point from your slides about the possible use of OSCOR instead of uh, other protection mechanisms. Yeah, this was more minor discussion points that popped up. These are not errors in the draft and it's not security problems. This would be feature changes if we change anything. But... Yeah, I think really the, the point of requiring TLS uh, um, or DTLS here is that for those there is a clear understanding how you get from the uh, text string in, in the authority of, of the URI uh, to uh, the, the requirements for validating the certificate that uh, the server provides uh, to to the kind of uh, uh, communication security that that uh, uh, you are assuming. So OSCOR doesn't have that defined yet. So if if I give an OSCOR implementation something that starts with uh, uh, colon Facebook dot com, it, it's not quite clear what what the OSCOR implementation is is supposed to do with that. So I don't think we can make that feature extension at this point in time. We might, we might be able to do that later. Yeah, I think I agree. Number four was raised by Michael, who said that he didn't want to implement PKCS seven yeah. made me at least me wonder why why it is pkcs seven in the first place instead of just sending the same structure as in bag or chain so when, when people say pkcs seven here they do need do, do mean cms right we, we're not talking about yeah. rfc 2315 yeah, and, and it's the cert only, it's a CMS structure that's cert only, it has no content. Right, it's it's what's commonly called P7C. Okay. Okay, so what I hear is that uh, people believe we should not be mandating only uh, PKCS7, but leave possibility to have other things there as well. Uh, is, is my understanding correct? Um, I think that would be an easy, quick fix. Do that solve your problems, Michael? I think so. Could maybe any of you provide some text um, for this? I can provide text if you want me to. Okay, thank you, John. And I don't know if we have time left. This is uh, so. Based on this discussion, I tried to, there was a lot of requests for what discussions about X509 drafts and also requests about tags for the 
Seabor encoded X509 certificates. Um, so I try to make make some text for this on uh, on the GitHub version. Uh, and first uh, the defining a structure similar to X509 that can hold one or more certificates. Uh, and then that same structure is used in bag, in chain, and in the URI option, and also in the Seabor tag that was requested at the last interim or on the list. I don't remember. Uh, but I think the same structure could be used in all these four places. And also it seems to that uh, my understanding of Jim's X509 draft is that uh, the X5U is, it's not specified that it's a chain, which probably makes it a bag. But for the Seaborn encoded X509 certificates, the discussion with Joran, we think it would be make most most sense to make the URI C5U and also the tag strictly chain, chains. That's uh, the most easy to process for small IoT devices. So if you have to choose one of them, chain seems like the right choice. But uh, if you don't have any direct comments, feel free to read this on GitHub. Otherwise, it will it will be this is the current version, so this will end up in the next submitted version of the draft. Unless there are some more comments on this. Um, this is Jonathan Hamill. I have a comment. Um, so you said the, the formatting is uh, similar to X5 bag and X5 chain, um, but in the, for those um, components, if it's a single certificate, then it's encoded as um, as a beaster, where it, and then if there's multiple components, it's it's the array. Whereas I think you've defined it differently there. Yes. Um, so this is. A single certificate here is defined as a Seabor sequence. So even a single certificate needs to be wrapped in an array. Um, and then the idea here would be that you wrap one or more certificates in a single array. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, I don't, that's the most compact representation. I don't know if there is the best to implement uh, feedback on that is uh, what's when, when you say wrapped in an array you're talking about the the cddl representation yes so the the cddl group is yeah. inserted in a but cddl the, when, when, array <laughs> when you look at the data on the wire it, it's a naked byte string and if you have two in there, then you have a sequence of two naked byte strings, right? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I think it, it it's uh, definitely possible to decode. It's You get a unique encoding for everything, but uh, then the question is if this is um, previously gotten questions about um, uh, how easy things are to implement with with Seabor libraries and so on. I think that's discussion we need to get back to. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else to add here, or maybe we can move to? Goran's presentation. I guess people will uh, look at this. At yeah. It. Yeah, that's fine with me. Mm. 
trick. So Coran, the floor is yours. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we, we've had a discussion on COSI registrations in IANA registrations, on, on in particular on algorithms and elliptic curves. And I'd like to get some more, try to summarize the discussion and get some more feedback on, on some of the points. Next slide, please. So, um, as, as it's defined today, the algorithms are typically not bundled with the curve. Uh, so, for example, signature algorithm is bundled with, with a hash function, but not with the elliptic curve. And uh, the RFC 8152 and also the BIS document specifies how to handle this uh, when new curves are, are considered. And there has been uh, the reason why we're discussing is, is the question because there is also an example of uh, a case where it's actually defined bundled with the, with the curve. And uh, we seem to agree uh, on, on the mailing list that this case is actually an exception, uh, which was used to restrict the use of COSI to a legacy case and uh, also limit some security issues related to that. So um, uh, we, we seem to agree that there is, when, when we get new requests for new registration, we try to follow the rule about separating the algorithm from, from the curve. And similarly, this should apply to, to ECDH, which is bundled with key derivation or key wrap, but not with elliptic curve. So any comments on this or have I understood this right? I, for EDDSA, the hash algorithm is determined by the curve. Right. So it's actually, in this case, it's it's ECDSA when it's when it's actually bundled with a hash function. But it's not the case that this, the signature algorithm is bundled with a curve. Yeah. No. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Okay, then we have an, one open issue. That's the next next slide, please. That's the case how to handle the fact uh, of a case when, when we have easy groups with, with cofactor different from one. So RFC 8152 is, is not looking at that case. And to handle that case, there is a need to multiply the cofactor in the Diffie-Hellman calculations or the shared secret calculations to protect certain attacks. And the question is, how do we handle? Uh, do we need any new registration to handle this case? Uh, and it seems that we will not need to have specific. I mean, for if we have, we don't want to have one uh, registration for for each curve. So we like like to do something in general. And the two candidate solutions are, one is that we, uh, we basically duplicate all the Diffie-Hellman registrations and define uh, sort of a copy of the registration, but with cofactor different than one. And another solution is that we sort of allow this the current registration to include uh, multiple sort of cofactors different from one as well as cofactor equal to one. And that could be handled by defining in the ECDH operation or the shared secret encoding how uh, how to how, how to multiply with the cofactor. And that can be defined in the curve specification. So those are the two candidate solutions I've heard from this. Mainly, Ilari has provided input here and some support. It would be good to hear if there are other other solutions and if there is any preferred solution. Um, there was a, a voice here about saying that solution two seems more robust because um, basically if you define it with, with the curve, there is no way to perform the wrong ECDH operation or shared secret calculation. Uh, Joran, I think, yeah, I think 
several of the curve 255119 and um, curve 448 already have cofactors. So I think it's not uh, Diffie Hellman with cofactors in general, it's Diffie Hellman referring to 6090 with cofactors. All right, good, good. Yeah. Yes, it's the same type of history here. So, but that, for those cases, like for instance, we have this case when you want to do easy DSA with uh, with curve two five five one nine. And should we define? Yeah. So these are two two proposals. Any any other comments on that? So this is not a terribly substantive comment, uh, but it seems potentially of an issue where if, you know, the procedures for multiplying by the cofactor are somehow buried in a obscure corner of the specification for using that curve, uh, I don't know how much of a risk there is that somebody would, would overlook that and just assume they know how to do ECDH and and miss that part. But that's a pretty speculative risk and I don't have any concrete thing I can point to. So, so but what you're saying then is that if we introduce a specific um, registration, a specific code point, would that make that less less likely? I mean, you might on, a, on an absolute scale, probably not. I mean, I think there would be slightly different risks, and it's not clearly better. So, so this is Hank. I can see how you're, you're, of course, struggling with the pro of cons here, Ben. In general, why actually, uh, yeah, um, specify more. Uh, but, but, but again, I, I think that there's, there's a more robust solution to has a ring to it and i would agree with the could that be buried so far away that people not well uh, familiar familiar with this uh, with this uh, context might miss that and do that actually wrong so then i think that's a valid cause because everybody's doing it at some point and and everybody's going to create this and at some point and it's i think a clear statement seems very naively from my point of view to be way more uh, interesting than yeah, well, you know, it's a cofactor. It's it's been buried somewhere. Um, so I guess having a more clear, uh, robust option two, but I'm not sure where the specification actually uh, would happen. I don't know, but I, I'm I'm leaning to more transparency to not being buried. So that, that was your initial point. That's why I'm speaking up. Right. I, I think those are all good points, and I am. Coming to agree that option two may be more robust. Um, it does seem like if we do option two, then the requirement for being very upfront and clear about the cofactor is going to apply to every document that specifies a curve that has a cofactor, uh, whereas option one would, to some extent, only need one document that needs to be very clear about what's happening. But um, if I remember correctly, we do have the IANA designated experts that are going to look at these things as they come in. And so we should be able to rely on the experts to remember that cofactor is a thing and request that the specification be more clear about it if needed. Yes, that, that's one, one point. And I think, yeah, I think that you could still, I mean, if, if this is written in one specification, you could still imagine that someone who hasn't read that particular spec might make the wrong choice for the code point as, as well as, uh, as algorithm here. Yeah, not saying anything new. <laughs> so, okay, so it seems that you have a slight, uh, Preference for for solution two then then. Any other comments?
Okay, thanks. Next slide, please. This, this is just an informational point here. Oops. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Sorry. So my my. Uh, I went into some sleep mode here. Not not personally. My computer went into some sleep mode. So uh, that's why I asked. So this is about a comment about the deterministic signatures, whether that has a, any impact on the code points. And this, we agreed in the group that that is only recommendation. So that should not be any reason to not use the particular uh, code point. But we should probably change this recommendation, or that, that was a discussion point. I just want to note that here, and I don't think we have time to discuss it now. So unless there are any other comments, and you don't disagree with this, let's go to the next one. Um, there is a request to register a curb for use with ECDSA and Shake 256, which means that following this, the principle we have discussed, we need to register ECDS with Shake 256. I just wanted to raise this because there is no definition currently. It would be similar to what's done in, in RFC 8692, but this is missing. Any opinions on this? It will be a big bike shed for what to use as the short name. <laughs> Yeah. Because this is, uh, you have to fix the output length of the shake as well. So this is the 512 bit output of shake 256. Correct. Right. Is this something the COSI should take on as a, as a work item? Should we, or should we ask the person that wants to register the curve to fix it? Or what's the, so we can review it or what's what's the working group's opinion where did the request come from this is part of of this curve registration draft from from elwig okay okay uh. yeah i think my personal opinion is that it is something that's totally in scope for the working group to do if we want to, but it's also totally fine to just ask the group that wants it to to fix it up so it's doing the right thing. Um, so since no one is jumping up to say that we definitely should do this, uh, the most expedient thing seems to be to request changes in the document from Elwig. Yeah, I agree. Okay, good. Next slide. And this is the last slide. So there was also a request to specify a curve with multiple key types, so both EC2 and OKP. And currently, the registration has only one key type per curve. And this is, so this is related to an, an ECDSA uh, uh, app application. So it actually is the case that RFC on 8152 only define ECDSA in terms of EC2. And at least to me, it's unclear if we can deviate from that. The only case where we speak about deviation, of, it's basically that we can add new curves. Uh, and it's not really clear to me actually why OKP is needed with ECDSA. So um, yeah, I'm looking for input here. Um, first of all, whether we need it and what kind of specification we would require. And then um, if this needs to be one or multiple code points. Can you use that? 
in particular so, the climate former question. Yeah, go ahead. Since no one else is jumping in, I will say that I had started looking at this while doing my ISG evaluation of the document in question. And my at least tentative conclusion is that we do need to stay true to what 8152 specified and that ECDSA has to use the EC2 um, point format and that we would not be able to use OKP without like updating 8152 again. Okay, that's a fair answer, I think. Great, I've got good feedback and uh, I know I've progressed uh, my evaluation of these requests. Thank you. And thank, you. Thank, thank you for putting in the time to do the review. Welcome. So we have two minutes left. Do we have time to talk about the uh, IANA policy issue that came up on the mailing list? I don't think that's enough to jog my memory of which issue that was. Maybe I need more coffee. Well, the, the issue is that the, the short labels are standards action. And we, we ha now have a document that wants to register a short label, but that's informational. And I think we, we just missed the fact that, that security area documents are often informational when, when they are kind of creating standards. Uh, so we, we have a gap there. So we would have to make this document standard strict for only the reason that it wants to have a short label. I see. So we, we might have wanted to leave ourselves an escape clause of standards action or ISG approval or something like that. Yeah, I, I never understood uh, whether not writing all ISG approval is is excluding ISG approval because in principle the ISG can approve anything. So um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm wondering whether we can just get away with a variance here where we say, okay, this is not a standards track document uh, formally, uh, but the, the for all intents and, pur and purposes it is. Um, or whether we actually have to to create a document that, that changes the IANA policy here. I do not have a solid answer for you off the top of my head. I would probably have to go ask the rest of the ISG. Yeah, so we, we probably want to, if we want to, change the policy from standards action to IETF review, which I think would be the more appropriate uh, policy, um, given the fact that we have informational uh, documents that need to do this. Uh, then we need to start this document pretty soon so we don't hold up the LWIG document. So, I mean, the LWIG document is currently suffering from a procedural discuss because the data tracker claims it is going for standards track. Yeah. I guess because of this. this Which is issue. because of exactly this issue, yes. Right, but it was only last called as informational. Yes, and, and uh, solving this problem here would mean that the Eric document can stay informational. Yeah. If we think that's right. I mean, th th that's... Yeah. Magnus expanded his discuss today or yesterday to also include that Elvig is not shorter to do any standard track documents. Yeah. Another reason not to try to do this. Yeah, I, I would be positive. I, I think uh, let's give René his informal draft and if we can fix the short registration some other way quickly, I think that would be positive instead of forcing this draft to be standard track right. it further. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I will take an action item to figure out if there is a, you know, what, I guess, figure out what our options are for getting a short code point for this thing. Okay, well, in that, I guess uh, our time is up. So, thanks a lot for all the participation and uh, useful discussions. And I hope to see you at the ITF meeting. Thank you. Thanks, bye bye. Thanks, bye.